If I had to choose one phrase to describe my year as a beekeeper this year, that would be mistakes were made. <laughs> So this year I set out with the goal to make pretty much as many mistakes as possible so that I could learn and grow as a beekeeper in my apiary. And I definitely accomplished that. I definitely learned what not to do. <laughs> um, apparently there's no queen in there. There were no eggs, no brood, no nothing. They have nothing. I would have liked to start doing this in July, but I'm gonna try it out in August and see what happens. But because of that, I push myself the most as a beekeeper. Today, I am splitting all of my hives. I currently only have three hives, and by the end of today, I'm going to have 10. <laughs> Talk to any beekeeper and they will warn you that one hive typically always turns into 10 or 20 or 30, it becomes an obsession that just snowballs. Well, it turns out I still managed to get stung once. They got me in the foot. I didn't know I had a hole in my sock by my ankle and they got to it, dang it. But good news, so I actually was able to split another two. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven um and then the two other ones so nine so i'm gonna have 12 total now like jesus i found some queens so i took advantage and i took a couple of them out and put them in these hives um but the rest of them are gonna get the new queens that i got in the mail so let's take them over to the other yard we are about done oh finally i'm getting tired <laughs> So when I made all these splits, I did just a single frame in each deep box and then added these mated queens the following day. Looking back, I'd say this was my first mistake of the year, putting just a single frame in a deep versus sticking them in a smaller box like a nuke. The nighttime temps were high enough that I didn't have to worry about chilled brood or anything, but bees do perform better when they're in a space that's just slightly bigger than the colony size. This is because in a smaller space, it is easier for them to maintain temperature of the brood and it gives them less space to have to patrol for intruders. So looking forward to next year, this is something that I will definitely be making sure I do whenever I make a split. I will always put them in a nuke versus putting them in a deep box. As like I said, I put pretty much all my splits into a deep this year and they definitely did not build up as quick as they could have. Um, so that kind of impacted how my honey weight would be throughout the year and how fast the colony grew. Luckily, I did have a really good success rate in terms of queen acceptance in these new colonies. So that was really nice not, have, not to have to worry about trying to find them a queen and trying to make them a queen. Um, I think if they were not accepted, I would have really struggled to get the colony off their feet considering that it was only on one frame. But odd enough, I actually ended up having queen problems with my three original colonies. Mm. Okay, so it's a good thing I checked on them because <laughs> um, apparently there's no queen in there. There were no eggs, no brood, no nothing. They have nothing to make a queen. So I'm gonna go to one of my other hives and get some milk brood and throw it in there so that they don't become a laid worker colony. <laughs> Great. I left eggs and brood in there when I split, but I, uh, I honestly didn't give them very much. Like it was, it was pretty thin. I was taking a risk. So apparently I should have put more in there. So let's go get some milk brood. 
Milk brood is a term that beekeepers use to call those open brood cells that you see. So those cells that you see a little larva swimming around in what looks like this white milky liquid, that is what we call milk brood. So what happens when you add in a frame like this is the bees are able to make it into a queen. They will take the youngest larva that is on that frame and they'll feed it royal jelly so that it then becomes a queen so that you don't have to buy one or do anything else. You just throw a frame in there, come back, check on it in about five, six days to see if they've uh, drawn out a cell and then you just leave it until the queen hatches and goes and mates. Now luckily for this particular hive that did in fact work but it did put me back a little bit on how many bees I had in the colony ready for the spring flow. So it did put me back a little bit because I messed up a little bit with re either removing my queen or also I remember that when I had gone in to do all of my splits, I had seen all of these queen cells on the face of the comb. So usually when you see that, that means they're making an emergency queen. And I removed these frames and put them into the new colonies for them to use as a queen, not even thinking about the fact that they were definitely making those cells because either their queen was dying, she swarmed and left already, or just something was wrong with her that they had to replace her. Shortly after that, I started having problems in two of my other original colonies. Now, I don't really know why I was having queen problems. Um, I'm still a little puzzled on that. But I kept finding dead queens on the bottom board. So I don't know if maybe these two colonies, since they were close, was sending out robber bees and was killing their queen. Um, because I have heard that that can be possible in some colonies. But luckily, I was able to, right, one of the colonies was able to make their own queen, um, so they ended up being okay. But this other one, I ended up having problems with for around a month. I underfed them throughout the winter, I didn't leave them enough honey, and they really struggled to get through the spring. They didn't really get to build up well enough. Um, and then also, like I said, they ended up replacing their queen, and every time they made a queen, either she didn't come back from her mating flight, or the cell just wasn't good and ended up failing. But I ended up having to add this Saskatraz uh, queen, which thankfully they did accept, but this hive was definitely um, a headache and causing a lot of stress because they probably went around a month without a queen at all. So because of this, they took the entire summer to even build up and they didn't really truly get built up until August or September. So really it set these colonies back quite a bit so looking forward um definitely going to try everything i can to make sure that i don't have queen problems in the spring for the spring flow because it's crucial that they have their full force of the colony if you've ever used plastic foundations that weren't waxed exactly perfect then i'm sure you've probably had to deal with wonky comb before so today i'm going to give you some ideas of how to fix that so all of these hives I just split this year. There's nine in total. These are all brand new and I decided to try out plastic foundations. Now some of them was okay, but a lot of them they didn't really like. Um, I don't think that I waxed them properly. I think I waxed them actually too much if that's a thing. Um, because yeah, they're drawing it out kind of wonky and it's really making a mess. So I'll show you. This is a prime example of wonky comb. Um, so yeah, I really probably should have gotten a hold of this way sooner, but I was waiting on some new frames and boxes to come in before I did this. And I see I probably should have done it right away. So looking back, I did in fact wax these frames way too much. Um, the key is you don't want the wax to go inside those little circle cells of the actual plastic foundation because when it completely coats it like that they still can't find um like the grooves of the cells but plastic foundation ended up not being bad i actually ended up learning a ton about how to build comb in colonies this year especially since i had so many brand new colonies that i was starting out but there are some tricks you can use to draw out a perfect frame on a poorly waxed foundation like this. 
but to have an entire deep box full of poorly waxed plastic frames, um, yeah, <laughs> it doesn't really end up well. Um, you really need to be on a heavy, heavy nectar flow or you need to be feeding, which I wasn't even feeding. Um, actually, I didn't even start feeding until the fall time this year. So going forward, though, I will probably never wax my frames again just because it is so time consuming and it just saves yourself a headache. Okay, so I'm looking inside at the eggs and the larva. And do you see that cell right there in the middle that has three eggs? Well, you're probably thinking, well, maybe the, the queen made a mistake. Well, here's another one with three eggs and two eggs. Let's see, there's one with a larva and another egg. Two larvas, two larvas. Yeah, all of these cells have more than one larva or egg inside them. And that is the tell on whether you have a laying worker colony. So I am here checking in on my laying worker colony and I noticed a couple things. So it is exactly six days after I had put in two frames of milk brood, two capped queens, and two queen cups. Um, I've looked into it a little bit more and a lot of the research that I have been reading has been saying it is best when you're working on a laying worker colony to put in a put in one or two frames of open milk brood because it's actually the milk brood, the open brood that releases the pheromone that prevents all of the worker bees from developing mature ovaries. So it's actually not the queen that prevents them from developing ovaries, it's the brood. So what I ended up learning after having my first laying worker colony is, in all honesty, you're better off just combining that colony with another colony over newspaper. So I tried the whole method of adding in multiple frames of milk brood every single week and in all honesty, you're going to be wasting a lot of resources doing that just for kind of like a maybe. I mean, you can get it to turn around and accept a queen and take off again, but the time that you lost trying to get them to that point, because it's going to take at least a month, you're better off just combining it with another colony, letting that build up, and then doing a split off of it if you really need that colony back. It was cool seeing my first laying worker colony and if you look in each one of those cells you'll notice that you see multiple larvae or multiple eggs. That is the tell all sign that you have a laying worker colony. So that and also I noticed that the bees will do a sort of roar when they don't have a queen. So that is also some good information just to know when to tell if they are queenless without even looking for a queen. Today is the big day that I go from 12 hives to 25. So I have 10 nukes sitting over here that I'm gonna put into boxes today. And then I plan to take a couple splits off of my strongest hive at a different location tomorrow. So we're moving on pretty quickly. On the last week of July, I ended up moving in 10 more nucleus colonies to expand my apiary. Now, luckily this ended up turning out absolutely wonderful. The guy that I got my bees from um, had a genetic of bee that grew very, very fast. So they were able to expand and build the colony just in time for winter. So this was a win in my book. Now, later this year, I did end up finding out that these bees pretty much had no resistance to Varroa at all. They were so sensitive to it. You see all those? Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, okay, let me count these real fast. Varroa just grew exponentially in these colonies versus my Saskatraz bees, but... I had big goals coming along for next year, so my focus was to build up my numbers in colonies so that I could do this. Well, today is day one towards my goal of eventually having a genetic OB across most of my apiary that is resistant to mites. My goal with this is I would like to be able to provide all of my northern climate folks up here a option to be able to bring in resistant genetics into their colonies. Um, call me crazy, but I do believe that we can restore some, if not all the balance between the honeybees and the mites so that the honeybees are on top and maybe one day, decades from now, mites won't even be an issue. I don't know, but 
I'm really interested in helping this fight. So I guess this is day one towards rearing queens with uh, resistant qualities. I plan to bring in a breeder queen. Um, I'm not sure when I'm gonna do it yet. I might wait until the spring because I would like to rear a lot of queens off of her. Um, before she goes out and gets mated, I would bring in one that's already inseminated. So I don't know, I still have a lot to learn, but <laughs> there's only so much information you can consume in one day. So let's go. <laughs> in my program, I'm gonna be looking for resistance, whether they're calm or aggressive. Um, I'm honestly kind of tired of taking care of aggressive bees. I'm tired of having to wear a suit all the time, so I'd like to be a little bit more gentle. And what are my top performers when it comes to honey producing? So, yeah, that's what I'll be looking for. <laughs> Look at all of these hives that I need to requeen. There's 10 in total that need queens because I don't like the genetics and all of my splits, I'm just gonna give them new queens since I didn't like the genetics they were coming from anyway. So I did my best to learn everything I possibly can about grafting and I decided that instead of buying queens, I'm gonna graft them. <laughs> Hopefully it's not too late in the season. It is um, August, 4, or August 5th actually today in Michigan, so kind of pretty close because I'm gonna have to graft these queens pray that they take on my first try <laughs> and then hope that they can go out and get mated with no problems um, I'm gonna graft more queens than I need just in case I have losses because you got to expect that but yeah so today is day one of learning how to graft and I'm gonna show you what I'm gonna do so how convenient, I already had these from when I got my colonies. So I'm gonna learn how to graft in a nuke. So today I'm gonna go into hive number seven. It's my Saskatraz um, hive that showed up as only two mites. I want them to feel like they're crowded and there are so many bees in here and they have so many resources. Have a frame of honey right here frame of bee bread right here and then capped brood right here with um, a little bit of uh, milk brood and some eggs actually mixed in so I'm gonna have to go back through this to make sure there's no queen cells and make sure there's no young larva that they could possibly make into a queen um, in two days when I come back but this is a good start also I noticed that that colony had a lot of drones and they had a lot of queen cups so I'm starting to wonder if maybe they're wanting to swarm anyway so this will work out to my favor if they were now it wouldn't be grafting day without a good storm now would it I swear my luck but I waited out the majority of it so hopefully I don't get poured on and yeah <laughs> The key is to get larva that is really young and it's supposed to be shaped like a comma, not C-shaped. So yeah, they're pretty small. And because I'm doing this on a waxed frame, that is what makes it even harder. <laughs> because it's so hot outside, it's like 95 degrees right now doesn't look like it I know it's like all dreary outside but it's humid and hot so this wax like I started to get down in there with this little tool and it pokes through the wax so you have to have very gentle steady hands <laughs> okay I guess the only thing left to do is just close her up and check on her in a couple days to see if it worked oh I really hope it did <laughs> I have been moving pretty fast and taking a lot of risks in my apiary this year, but there are only two ways that you can learn. Either make mistakes, take risks, and learn through trial and error, or you can learn through others. But if you never try, you will never know and you will never learn and grow as an individual. So that is what i'm kind of doing with this channel we are going to learn and grow together in beekeeping we're going to figure out what works what doesn't work i'm going to show you all of the mistakes i made firsthand so that you can also learn from the mistakes as i learned from my own mistakes as well so today we're going to figure out can you overwinter a nuke that has started in august 
Stick around and you'll find out. So since I last spoke with you, I was grafting queens that I was gonna use to requeen um, a lot of my hives in my breeding program. But since then, I've done a lot of research and I've changed my mind. So let me catch you up to speed real fast. So over the last three days, I have been hard at work cutting wood and building five frame nukes, but not just regular five frame nukes, double story five frame nukes. Now you're probably wondering, why did I do this? I stumbled upon a lecture by Mike Palmer and Adrian Queenie, and I was so inspired by both. Um, so let me catch you up to speed. If you haven't seen those before, I will just briefly summarize it so you have a better understanding of what I'm talking about. So in both of their methods, they use a nuke as the backbone of a sustainable apiary. I'm quoting Mike Palmer on this because this is literally what he says. So the idea with this is, is these nukes become factories for brood and for building out comb. So with a nuke, you are able to strengthen any of your, your stronger hives, any of your weaker hives, your production hives. You can strengthen any hive in your apiary by adding in brood. And then if you ever need comb to be built out, instead of putting it in your production hive to be built out, you put it in one of these five frame nukes and they'll build it out in just a couple days. Now you're probably wondering, okay, but why do you have to overwinter them? When you overwinter a nuke, that queen literally explodes in the next spring. So like I said, these little boxes literally become, a, uh, literally become factories for your apiary and they can work wonders. So I decided I'm gonna use them to my advantage. Um, yes, I wish I was learning about all this sooner. I would have liked to start doing this in July, but I'm gonna try it out in August and see what happens. So this is where things got a little chaotic. I spent the rest of the summer figuring out all the different ways to get my bees to build out comb. Even in no flow pretty much in August, um, we didn't really have much of a fall flow this year. So I was feeding heavily. And I hate to say it, but everyone who said that this would be too late to do nukes was yes in fact correct. But I learned so much from this experience and wouldn't change a single bit of it. Okay, so I know the title is a little clickbaity, but I didn't lie. My hives are in fact gone from that location. I, because of some personal events that have happened over the last month, I had to move all of my colonies to a brand new location. So welcome to their new home. We are now located in the woods. I have them all kind of spread out. And the really good thing about this location is there are multiple wildflower fields surrounding these woods. Um, actually, when I was moving all these here, I noticed there is a ginormous field full of um, the Maximilian, I don't think I'm saying that right, but there's sunflowers. Um, and then there's also a huge wildflower field over there. So they're definitely gonna have a lot more resources over here, which is good. But yeah, welcome to the new home of the Beefit Bee Yard. 
this year was full of growth. If you had told me three years ago when I picked up my first beehive that I would be here, I would not have believed you. But it's true. Beekeeping changed my life. And it will continue to change my life as I truly believe that this is what I was put on this earth to do. So I want to thank you. Thank you for every video you've watched and every comment and words of encouragement that you've left me. We are creating a family through which we will change the beekeeping landscape.